Patricia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chong Su Lee. Um, and I'm really pleased to see all of you here, although I know that uh, you know, this will be counted towards your assessment. So welcome. <laughs> okay. uh, now, I enjoy many things about GIFT. I, I really treat this place as if I'm having a holiday. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, uh, the first is that we work on the most beautiful element in the whole of the periodic table. It is so complicated that we haven't finished with it. And it's also the most stable element in the universe. So eventually, anybody who's not working in, for example, on magnesium, will not have a job, okay? Because <laughs> all the elements will decompose towards iron. <laughs> Just in pure iron, we have, uh, you know, the body-centered cubic, the hexagonal close-packed, and the cubic close-packed crystal structures. And inside those crystal structures, every one of those phases has a magnetic transition, which is absolutely vital to the properties of those phases. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy coming to GIFT, because everybody here is interested in iron in one way or another. So if I want to find out about forming, I have Frederick here. Yeah? If I want to find out about clean steel making, I go upstairs, climb all the stairs to the fifth floor, and so on. There's no other institute in the world where we have all subjects connected with steel uh, in one place. And trust me, I've been to many, many parts of the world where steel's research is done. The second reason is, you know, I'm really good at a particular sport. <laughs> and very recently, I wiped the floor with all of these people. Okay, I beat them in the squash championship. And then we had the, our celebration dinner. Now, all of these people have done military service. I haven't, and I'm also a vegetarian. But I beat them all. And Professor Chong Su Lee said to me, how can this be? Are you taking drugs? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so I really enjoy my time at GIFT. And today, I'm going to tell you about um, a particular form of iron which is very exciting. Now, in the previous lecture that we had, the seminar, Professor Nongmun Wang gave an excellent lecture in which he briefly introduced uh, the idea of immersive thinking. And probably, most of you used one particular word because he said it in Hindi. In, uh, in an Indian language. Did anyone spot that? Okay, so in Indian, immersive thinking is this. He mentioned this, actually. He said samadhi. Samadhi means you totally focus on one particular subject. Are, there, are you familiar with this? Yeah? Okay. So almost everybody else missed it, right? But samadhi is an ancient form of immersive thinking and mostly connected with religion but also with philosophy. But you know, uh, I tried after his lecture to focus on one thing, but uh, the Dongwu here kept on disturbing me. So I couldn't do that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> what you need in order to have immersive thinking is one extra thing, okay? And that is that you need a crisis, a confusion of information which you cannot actually rationalize so that there's a lot of findings which simply cannot be explained so they start to trouble you more and more and then you cannot focus on other things. Okay? So I would say you need one additional thing in order to have samadhi, and that is huge amount of knowledge accumulated which cannot be explained. And possibly that's when you get a breakthrough. So this isn't my, none of these are my original ideas, but I can't remember who told me that, okay? Okay, so. Uh, let me just go briefly through the physical metallurgy of steels, okay, in one slide. First of all, uh, steel means iron and carbon, and carbon is in the interstices inside the crystal structure. We know that it has a much lower solubility in ferrite than in austenite. But remember that whenever we talk about solubility, we have to consider two phases, okay? So when we add sugar, to tea is the solubility of sugar with respect to tea. 
sugar might have a different solubility when it's in contact with alcohol, and so on. So when we talk about solubility later on in the lecture, we have to talk about solubility with respect to another phase with which the ferrite is in contact. Uh, given just iron and carbon, we can generate a very large number of phase transformations and therefore vary the structure of the steel enormously. And carbon, we know, doesn't fit very well in the lattice of ferrite. Whoops, sorry. Uh, doesn't fit very well in the lattice of ferrite and therefore it causes intense hardening. Very well known facts, okay? So in, in ferrite, carbon sits in these octahedral interstices and you should immediately note that the distance here to here is not the same as here to here. So it's not a regular octahedron, okay? On the other hand, in the distance this way, this way, that way, are all identical, so it's actually a regular octahedron and that has profound consequences on the properties, uh, mechanical properties. Okay, so that's a summary of the steel metallurgy that you need to know in order to understand the rest of the lecture. These are a few of the hundreds of phase transformations that you can generate in steel. Okay? So you've all heard of Wiedmannstein ferrite, bainite, acicular ferrite, martensite, perlite, massive ferrite. Uh, these are different shapes of ferrite. And you classify them into two broad schemes. One is where the transformation occurs by a homogeneous deformation of the parent phase. And another where you break all the bonds and the bonds get rearranged into a different pattern. And then we have all the precipitates and many, many other things, magnetic transitions, etc. This is why steel is the most used material in the world. Now, I'd like to focus on one particular phase transformation here, although the principles that I'm going to talk about will cover many, many uh, other structures. Uh, bainite uh, has always been confusing, simply because it occurs in a temperature regime where both diffusion and displacements might be possible, okay? Uh, whereas if you think about martensitic transformation, there is absolutely no doubt that it's a diffusion-less transformation. And if you think about perlite, there's absolutely no doubt that it involves long-range diffusion of elements. So let's imagine that this is, well, this is the structure of bainite in which there is sufficient uh, silicon added to prevent the precipitation of cementite and you get these beautiful, extremely fine plates of bainitic ferrite separated by regions of austenite. So that's austenite and that's ferrite. Back uh, many, many years ago, uh, Coe and Cottrell, 1950-ish, looked at surface displacements due to bainite. Okay? And that's where all the confusion started because when you see surface displacements, it's obvious that the atoms have been displaced. But some people do not want to believe that that is evidence for a displacive transformation, even though it's staring you right in the face. Now, in those days, the resolution of the techniques was not enough to see individual plates. Uh, you know, it was basically optical interference microscopy. Now, you can do the same experiment using atomic force microscopy, where basically you can resolve surface displacements very accurately. And these are displacements due to individual platelets and a very, very large shear deformation. Okay? So this and a lot of other evidence shows that the transformation is displacing. And if I summarize a huge amount of information, then this is the mechanism of the bainite transformation and that's all you need to know for today's lecture, that the plate of bainite forms exactly like martensite. Okay? However, it's forming at a temperature where carbon atoms are mobile, and therefore the carbon escapes into the adjacent austenite shortly after transformation. Here is the carbon in the austenite. And if you leave it long enough, you will get precipitation of cementite either between the plates or both inside the plates and between the plates, in, in which case we call that structure lower bainite. Okay? So it's a diffusion-less transformation when 
it actually happens with partitioning of carbon subsequent to that process. And this is the phase diagram that I'm going to focus on today. And that is looking at the equilibrium between ferrite and austenite. This is just taken from the literature where we have here the solubility of carbon in ferrite, which is in equilibrium with austenite. And I've expanded this region here. And you can see that the maximum solubility is of the order of 0 0.01 weight percent when ferrite is in contact with austenite. Okay? And these uh, curves are really quite important because this retrograde shape, that means the fact that it bends backwards, has consequences on various things. I won't go into them in detail, but you need to do these calculations accurately and not simply use the sort of polynomial equations that come about in thermodynamic databases. Okay? So this is actually done using quasi-chemical theory. But the main point is you can see that the solubility of carbon in ferrite, which is in contact with austenite, is very, very small. Okay, so this is where the confusion starts to begin. This is an experiment that uh, my colleague Bob Vaux and I did in Cambridge back in 1981. And these are basically atom probe images where each dot represents a single atom. And today I don't want to focus on the large elements like silicon, manganese, and so forth. They, they simply do not move during transformation. But I explained to you that bainite forms without diffusion, and then the carbon partitions into the austenite. However, so this is the austenite here, and this is the ferrite, and you can see less carbon in the ferrite than in the austenite. Now these are just images. You can do quantitative measurements of the concentrations using time of flight mass spectroscopy, which is routine stuff these days. But back in 1981, we constructed the atom probe our, ourselves. And it's quite an adventure to collect you know, 100,000 atoms over a period of a couple of days. Whereas the atom probe in POSTEC can collect 10 million atoms, I think, in a few hours. Okay, so the confusion arises because when you measure the carbon concentration in the bainitic ferrite, it's orders of magnitude greater than the solubility of carbon in ferrite, which is in contact with austenite. So immediately you could say, you know, we have direct evidence that it is truly a diffusion-less transformation because we have so much more carbon inside the bainitic ferrite than is demanded by equilibrium. But being cautious scientists, yeah, we said, okay, you know, we just cannot imagine that the carbon would remain inside the ferrite because at the temperatures where bainite forms, it has plenty of time to subsequently escape into the austenite. But it's there, you know, and it's there even though this particular phase transformation is at 400 degrees centigrade, the carbon is in the ferrite. So how do we explain that? So we speculated that it's segregated to dislocations. Yeah? Dislocations are traps for carbon and it's quite reasonable to think that if the carbon is trapped at dislocations, then it's not, uh, it's not, it has to unbind before it partitions into the austenite. Okay? So that was back in 1981. And this work uh, stimulated a large number of experiments by many groups. So this is the group with the atom probe in Chalmers University in Sweden, uh, the people in Oxford who had the atom probe, and so on. And that uh, everyone uh, basically argued that the excess carbon is at dislocations. Okay? But then there were two breakthroughs which changed the scene. The first is the discovery of nanostructured bainite. I'm not going to go into detail. Just look at this picture. This is a scale of 20 nanometers here. And these are the crystals of bainitic ferrite, which are finer than carbon nanotubes on the same scale. And we can do this for thousands and thousands of tons of material. 
So I'm not uh, interested in this talk about nanostructured bainite, but the fact that it can be generated at a very low temperature, okay, not 400 degrees centigrade, but as low as 125 degrees centigrade. Takes many days, all right? Takes 10 days, but you can generate it. Uh, and furthermore, it is purely a mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite. There's nothing else there. Okay? So it's a very clean system, and you can do uh, much more conclusive experiments, uh, phase transformations experiments with it. And the second is, you know, the atom probe scene just took off because you can now buy atom probes commercially which are extremely reliable. So it's no longer exciting to actually make atom probes. There are really good companies manufacturing atom probes just like transmission electron microscopes. We no longer construct transmission electron microscopes. Whereas if you go back to 1950s, people were making their own electron microscopes. Okay? So nowadays, we accept that yes, you can do atom probe analysis on most things and collect you know, 10 million atoms in two hours, etc. So the exciting thing is not the atom probe, but the information that you get from it. And thirdly, some of these atom probes are national facilities. That means if you have a good idea, you can put a proposal and you can use the machine freely, yeah. even if it's in another country. So one such center is uh, at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. They call it the SHARE facility. And the person who invented nanostructured bainite is a lady called Francisca Caballero who was working in Cambridge. And she decided to link up with Oak Ridge National Laboratories and conduct a lot more experiments. So Mike Miller is at Oak Ridge National Laboratories and we started working with him. This actually uses a SIMS technique to measure, nano SIMS technique to measure carbon concentrations. And then Francisca Caballero, you can see there are many, many papers that she's written uh, using uh, the most advanced atom probe techniques. There's also measurements using um, uh, lattice imaging because the presence of carbon will change the lattice parameter. So you can directly image the lattice planes and from that work out the carbon concentration. So a very large amount of work, all of which uh, attributes carbon, the excess carbon, verifies first of all that you have a lot more excess carbon than you would expect from equilibrium, but that it's segregated to dislocations. So just to summarize, the concentration of carbon in alpha is far greater than consistent with equilibrium. So you're talking about orders of magnitude. Okay? Uh, there are numerous independent measurements to confirm this. And it's very surprising because, you know, at 200 degrees centigrade, carbon is easily mobile. Uh, yeah, so over the temperature range, 125 to 400 degrees centigrade, you would expect the carbon to leave the ferrite. And, of course, you can find lots of dislocations. So this is the interface between the austenite and the bainitic ferrite. So there's no problem or, you know, no logical problem of thinking that carbon should be at dislocations. Cottrell, after all, uh, demonstrated this back in the 1950s. But this is the most exciting paper that I've read in a long time, which stimulated uh, a great deal of agony and immersive thinking, okay? Samadhi. With the modern atom probes, you can collect a lot more information than you could do back in 1981. And sure enough, uh, Francisca and uh, Carlos Mateo, Mike Miller and another student uh, showed segregation to dislocations. That's exactly as expected. But with the large volume that you can sample now, relatively speaking, they measured carbon in solid solution away from defects very, very careful measurements where they proved that there is a large excess of carbon in solid solution, not at defects, even though this nanostructured bainite is actually transformed at something like 200 degrees centigrade for many days. So that simply does not make sense. 
you know, why should the carbon persist inside the magnetic ferrite even though you are giving it plenty of opportunity to partition into austenite where it should be more stable. Okay, here are some of her results uh, uh, which I've extracted from her paper uh, where we are plotting carbon which is in solid solution, not carbon which is segregated to dislocations. And that is far, far greater than the concentrations that are predicted by the phase diagram. <laughs> and you know, the, the odd thing is that you temper the material okay, for long periods of time, the mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite, and still the carbon remains in solid solution. Okay. So this is the first evidence which convinces me that there's something wrong. Uh, I mean, not wrong in the sense that uh, there's something wrong, but I don't understand it, okay? Uh, something odd. And furthermore, you know, if anybody wants to argue that the mechanism of transformation is not displacive, it's just foolish. So against all expectations, we have a huge excess of carbon in solid solution in the ferrite, and it stays there, even if you heat treat, you know, just like when you temper martensite, you expect the carbon to come out of that. And furthermore, the fact that the carbon remains in the ferrite makes the ferrite harder than the austenite, which has a much higher carbon concentration. So some years ago, Pascal Jacques uh, in uh, Leuven did experiments to show that the retained austenite in trip steel is actually harder than bainitic ferrite, okay? Now, in trip steels, you transform to bainite at around 400 degrees centigrade, yeah? But in this uh, nanostructured bainite, you transform at a much lower temperature and you retain a lot more carbon inside the bainitic ferrite. And work done in China using nano indentation shows that in this case, the bainitic ferrite is harder than the austenite, and the reason for that must be the excess carbon. Right, so let's just look at uh, the interstices again. So those of you who have been to my crystallography lectures, you can go to sleep for the moment. Um, here is the octahedral hole in ferrite, and this is the point group symmetry of that hole. So can one of you tell me what is that point group symmetry? Come on, guys. No, no, they are wide awake. I can see them. But, yeah, how about you at the back, Chun? Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> what, what is the uh, symmetry of this hole? That's correct, tetragonal, okay? Because there's a four-fold axis here and two-fold axis here and here. And this is the tetrahedral hole. And the tetrahedral hole is actually bigger than the octahedral hole, but you still have carbon atoms preferring the octahedral holes because in this, this distance here is much larger than, uh, than the vertical distance because this is a 110 type direction, which is this is a 100 direction. So you're only pushing two atoms apart effectively. Therefore, the strain energy is related to just one distortion. In this case, you are uniformly pushing apart four atoms, and therefore you get a larger strain energy. And there are also some first principles calculations which show that uh, there's a chemical term which is uh, more favorable for the octahedral interstices. Okay, so let's assume that the carbon will always occupy the irregular octahedra in ferrite. And notice one thing. If you put a carbon atom in the octahedral interstice, you actually reduce its tetragonality, okay? Because A is smaller than root 2A. You push the A atoms apart, and therefore you reduce the tetragonality. It's only if the carbon atoms order on one set of cube edges that you will get tetragonal ferrite. Right, so I will come back to this later, but notice that um, the number of octahedral holes per ion atom in ferrite is three. 
whereas the number of octahedral holes per ion atom in austenite is one. So the importance of that is that if you transform austenite into ferrite, the number of octahedral holes increases by a factor of three. Okay? And that is very, very important. You'll see later. So this is just uh, revising the mechanism that the transformation is diffusionless with carbon partitioning subsequent to transformation. Okay, let's draw two austenite unit cells next to each other. All right, so this is the face centered cubic structure. You can see these are the atoms at the face centers here and here, and these are the atoms at the corners. So I've just put two unit cells next to each other. Uh, I'll make those particular atoms red, okay? So it's still austenite. And if I join them up with bonds, then that is still austenite, but it's a different unit cell that I've identified. It's a body-centered tetragonal unit cell of austenite. Okay, so you know you can you can uh, for a given pattern, there's an infinite choice of unit cells. We choose cubic because it's convenient, but this is a perfectly valid representation of the unit cell of austenite, a body-centered tetragonal cell. Now. If you look at the octahedral interstices in the austenite, then they are located on the cell edges. Okay, here you can see this is the distance A gamma and over there. So these are crystallographically equivalent positions. Okay? And there's only one octahedral interstice per ion atom in austenite. When I compress that body-centered tetragonal austenite to produce body-centered cubic, all right, I get a tripling of the number of interstitial sites. So this is one sub-lattice of octahedral interstices in ferrite. This is the second sub-lattice of octahedral interstices in ferrite. And this is the third. Okay? So when you get transformation, the number of octahedral interstices per ion atom triples. Okay, so given that all those sites in the austenite were crystallographically equivalent, I only need to draw this one and this one, which are still crystallographically equivalent. But the point is that when I compress this and produce my body-centered cubic ferrite, both of these carbon atoms end up along the longest axis where the carbon atom is pushing apart because both of them end up in one subset of octahedral interstices. If I go back, there are three possible subsets. Okay? And when I transform austenite, these end up along one direction of the cell. And that is what gives you tetragonal martensite. The fact that you triple the number of interstitial sites per ion atom. So on transformation, all the carbon atoms, wherever they are located in the austenite, end up on one set of edges of the product unit cell. So what this means is that in a diffusionless transformation, you will necessarily get a body-centered tetragonal ferrite. Okay? Necessarily get a body-centered tetragonal ferrite. Supposing you heat treat that, the carbon atoms can move and migrate to other sublattices if they wish, and you might lose the tetragonality exactly as when you get tempering of martensite. But the very first transformation stage involves necessarily the creation of a tetragonal ferrite. Right, so here's Dong Wuso, and this is uh, Jae Hoon Jang. And he said, okay, let's do a calculation of the phase diagram between tetragonal ferrite and austenite. And he said, look, you know, I thought I had graduated. I don't have to do any more work. <laughs> okay? But in Korea, the students are very good, and they listen to what the professor says. So Jae Woon Chang did the calculations as follows, using first principles methods. So here we are plotting the atomic volume and the dissolution energy of carbon in, uh, uh, in 
In this case, it's the octahedral, irregular octahedral interstice, and in this case, it's the tetrahedral interstice. And not surprisingly, you know, the octahedral interstice is the favored location of carbon atoms in ferrite, if, if you look at these in detail. But the point is that from these calculations, you get this term here, which is the enthalpy of solution, or in, uh, because it's at zero Kelvin, it, you know, its enthalpy is the same as an internal energy. You get the energy of solution of carbon atom in tetragonal ferrite, okay? Because you set up the cell to be tetragonal. And you can, you can vary the C over A ratio um, for that, and you find that there is a certain C over A ratio which gives you the minimum energy. And then you plug those numbers into a thermodynamic calculation package like Thermocalc, you know, the databases. You modify the databases to include the calculations done using first principles, and you come up with something quite remarkable, all right? So look at the scale over here, and look at the solubility of carbon in tetragonal ferrite. Yeah, look at that. Compare that with cubic ferrite. So if you impose a tetragonal symmetry by diffusion-less transformation, that's a necessity in steel. If you impose a tetragonal symmetry, then why should you use cubic symmetry to do calculations of phase diagrams? Absolutely every paper ever published, as far as I know, when they do calculations on martensite or bainite, etc., including my own, yeah, assumes the thermodynamics of cubic ferrite. This tells you that that is not correct. Yeah? As a, I think it's a very exciting result. It may not change life as we know it, but I think it's a very exciting result. So, now we need to show that the bainitic ferrite actually has non-cubic symmetry. And th this is uh, basically a thermomechanical simulator, which you attach to some kind of high-energy X-rays, like a synchrotron, etc., and you do some very accurate X-ray measurements. And those measurements are done by these people here. So he is a PhD student in Cambridge, uh, a postdoctoral scientist in the University of Trento, and she is at uh, DESI, which is a European facility for doing such work. And we have submitted the paper, but it's not published yet. And the experiment here, well, it's not been refereed yet, okay? So I'm waiting in anticipation. Um, the experiment involves heating nanostructured bainite because we want to show that even at high temperatures, the carbon remains in the bainitic ferrite and then you get lots and lots of X-ray data collected every 30 seconds, uh, spectra generated every 30 seconds, and you analyze those very carefully. Now, we tried both tetragonal and orthorhombic symmetries because the only way that you can get orthorhombic symmetry is if some of the carbon atoms in austenite are not randomly distributed, right? Now, there are features of the phase transformation which can shuffle some of the carbon atoms into the wrong positions compared with random distribution. For example, the lattice invariant deformation associated with martensitic or bainitic transformation. So we tried both orthorhombic and tetragonal symmetries. And this is simply a fit parameter from Rietveld refinement of the X-ray information. And the smaller this number is, the better is your fit. And this is assuming a cubic, this is assuming a tetragonal, and this is assuming orthorhombic. So I can't really, at the moment, distinguish between orthorhombic and tetragonal, but what is absolutely clear is that it's not cubic. Uh, supposing we assume tetragonal cell, then you can see that during heating, Obviously, you get thermal expansion while there is no change in the structure. Yeah? So the lattice parameters are increasing. This is the C parameter and this is the A parameter. At around here, you're reaching temperatures where the austenite is no longer 
stable, it wants to transform into carbides, etc. And therefore, you get all these drops in lattice parameter. This carbon is being absorbed by carbides. If you assume that it's orthorhombic, you get a similar trend with the A, B, and C parameters. Now, uh, this is just showing you how the volume fraction of austenite changes. So as soon as you start to get cementite precipitation, of course, the volume fraction drops dramatically. Okay? Oh, sorry, that's the lattice parameter, and that's the volume fraction. So experimental results so far confirm that the ferrite is not cubic. We have only done first principles calculations for tetragonal ferrite, but yesterday Dongwu invited Jeun Jang for dinner, yeah? And there is no free dinner, yeah? <laughs> so he's going to come on Saturday from his job at POSCO to do calculations on the orthorhombic state. So you see, we are using uh, the students very effectively, pr Professor Jong Su Lee, yeah? Okay. Now, there is another story here, and you know, I haven't mentioned cementite, but this is the phase boundary for the equilibrium between ferrite and cementite, and that will be different from the equilibrium between ferrite and austenite. And Jeun Jang did these calculations for the equilibrium between tetragonal ferrite and cementite, and sure enough, again, the solubility increases quite significantly here. You can see these numbers. Now, this is, uh, the, we, when we first published our results on the tetragonal ferrite, we didn't publish this because we didn't think it was particularly exciting. This is a picture that I took in Japan in the early 90s. This is the longest single span bridge in the world. Yeah, it stretches more than two kilometers. So this, this gap here is two kilometers. And the amazing thing about this is that it connects the mainland and Awasi Island. And there are huge earthquakes there. So I've seen a step of one meter high when they had an earthquake. And the bridge is perfectly OK. Yeah? And the reason why the bridge is OK is, of course, steel. This is a typical cable. This is Hidetoshi Fuji from Osaka University who took me there. And this is actually the cable, the size of the cables that are holding the suspension bridge. And do you know what the cable is made out of? It's obviously steel, but what's the structure? Hmm? Yeah, it's drawn pearlitic steel with a very high strength. So you transform to perlite at a low temperature, and then you cold deform it severely. And there are many, many papers which show that when you call deform, some of the cementite goes into solution because as you cut the cementite, the size of the cementite can become smaller than the critical nucleus size. So it goes back into solution. So we should expect to find more excess carbon in the pearlitic ferrite. Uh, these are experiments that we did on the nanostructured bainite where we temper at various temperatures in order to uh, precipitate cementite. And you can see how reluctant the carbon is to get out of the ferrite. Okay? Now, the reason for this is, um, again, that if the ferrite is in, uh, if the carbon is in the ferrite and the ferrite is tetragonal, then you will get a greater solubility. But how can you possibly get tetragonal ferrite in perlite? Because there, everything is diffusing at the transformation front. Well, after we published our paper in Scripta, there was another paper, I'll, I'll come to that, uh, just very recently, 2013, published by the group at Max Planck Institute, where they showed that the strains that you put in during wire drawing actually are directional. Okay, so you've got elastic strains in there, which are effectively making your material tetragonal. And they did first principles calculations to show that the solubility increases in the carbon. So it isn't just that we are cutting up the cementite particles, making them smaller than the critical nucleus size. But by putting in these strains, you're actually 
increasing the solubility of carbon in the pearlitic ferrite. So in our new phase diagram for tetragonal ferrite, we have orders of magnitude greater solubility for carbon. It's therefore much harder than conventional steel. And we need to reinterpret many of the theories that we use, uh, assuming the thermodynamics of cubic ferrite. And we need to think about how to produce non-cubic ferrite without carbon. So in terms of thermodynamics, you see these, this diagram is from my book on bainite, but you can find many diagrams like this. Uh, when we plot the free energy curve versus carbon concentration, this, this is again from one of my books where in the kinetic equations, you know, we basically set the amount of carbon in the ferrite to be zero because the solubility is next to zero. And that's why you can see the amount of carbon in ferrite doesn't appear in, well, it appears here, but we assume to be zero. This is the time for carbon to escape from martensite or bainite, you know, the sort of thing that we do for quench and partitioning steels. Yeah? We have to reinterpret the value of this term, and it will have a significant effect on kinetics. Uh, the diffusivity measurements for uh, carbon in ferrite, we've got them over something uh, like 16 orders of magnitude. Okay? Ignore this high temperature part, which is basically because some of the carbon atoms occupy tetrahedral sites as well. But the way in which we interpret this diffusion coefficient is basically jumping of carbon atoms between tetrahedral and, tetrahed uh, tetrahedral and octahedral sites, but the symmetry of those sites will be changed. And long time ago, Hillett actually derived an equation for diffusion in tetragonal martensite. We want to look at that in more detail. So the question is, is it possible to produce carbon-free ferrite, which has tetragonal or orthorhombic symmetry? And the way we could do this is by ordering some of the atoms, substitutional atoms, inside the austenite. If you put some order into the austenite, then there is literature going back a long period in Russia where they produce carbon-free tetragonal or orthorhombic martensite. Now, he doesn't know it as yet, but we would also like to work on non-cubic austenite. And some time ago, he started doing some calculations on austenite for another reason. And I think if we can produce tetragonal austenite, and you can already do that if you deposit iron onto copper. Yeah? Because copper has a different lattice parameter, so if you put it epitaxially, then you put, uh, from Poisson's effect, you get a tetragonal austenite. If we can alter the magnetic properties by alloying, then we should be able to get tetragonal austenite according to some initial calculations that uh, SO has done. Okay? So, I think there is an exciting uh, avenue to explore. Whether or not it results in interesting mechanical properties or not, I don't know. But we have a new phase diagram for the iron carbon system where the transformation first happens without diffusion. Okay, so I've, I've finished and I'll be happy to answer questions.